Hello, welcome to uh, the talk from uh, Lou Bosch about uh, the year of the Linux virtual desktop. Please, a round of applause for Lou Bosch. Yeah, hi, I'm Lubos Saunetsky. Uh, I'm at Collabora. And uh, today I'm going to present about uh, XR on Linux in general in open source and um, the Linux desktop in uh, VR. So mostly uh, related to my work. And thank you all for attending. Uh, for your interest in my work, and also thank you for FOSTEM for having me and considering me for the main track. Uh, this is my third FOSTEM, but it's the first time uh, when, when I speak, so I hope it won't be the last time. Uh, usually I don't put up the date on my slides, but today's date is so nice, it's a palindrome, uh, so you can read it both ways, and it's the same in American and in normal notation. So. Um, uh, so this is me with a funny headset. Uh, it's an AR cardboard phone holder headset. Uh, if you have any complaints or questions about the talk, uh, please contact me uh, on email or uh, Twitter. Uh, so uh, I will start with a brief crash course uh, about what XR is, what, what kind of terminology we have there. Maybe I should start with... Uh, just uh, asking you, how many of you have ever tried AR or VR before? That's plenty, that's uh, nearly all of you. How many of you did that on Linux? Okay, that's way less. And how many of that uh, people that did that on Linux did that on a completely open source stack? That's even fewer. Um, Maybe nearly none. Uh, and this is where we uh, are working on right now, currently. Um, so I hope that this year, 2020, will, will improve the situation. There are some factors that, that will help with that. But uh, let's first start with this nice uh, diagram. It's by a guy called Milgram from 94. Uh, so VR is actually quite old already. And on this spectrum, we have the real world, the world we are in right now. Uh, on the left side and a completely virtual environment on the, on the right side. And in between, there are some, some steps. Uh, so augmented reality is, for example, if you have virtual elements in the real world, uh, like annotations for real objects, and uh, then we can go to the completely virtual world, and on the way we found the augmented virtual reality. This is when you have, for example, camera feeds or, or 3D um, point clouds of real objects in the virtual world. Uh, and this spectrum was uh, called mixed reality spectrum. Um, and um, the, the terms, uh, I have uh, listed the terms here again. And a more prominent term nowadays is maybe XR, which is called uh, X-reality or cross-reality. Uh, this is also what's the term that is used in the Kronos standard, OpenXR, for example. And this is the term I'm going to go with, because it uh, just summarizes all of these combinations of uh, realities, of inter-reality systems. And um, in terms of consumer-available headsets, I would just uh, point out three uh, categories we have there. For example, we have the, the simple uh, phone holder headsets, uh, which uh, run the phone's operating system, which render on the phone, and you have simple lenses in them. These are the most accessible. Uh, these are what people mostly use. The mo most people have contact with them. Of course, you can get it fancier than uh, as a, a piece of paper, but it's as simple as it can get. And of course, we have the PC tethered headsets. That's something for the PC gamer enthusiasts. Uh, I guess they're also more hacker-friendly since you can use your, your desktop, your regular Linux desktop, and, and uh, use the device uh, as, uh, as ever you like because you're root. Uh, and uh, on the right side, uh, I will point out the standalone headsets, which are similar to the phone thing, but like built from the ground up. Uh, so you have uh, an embedded computer in there, maybe in a belt, or maybe also integrated in the headset and the lenses are uh, better adjusted for the display 
in contrast to these phone holders, where, which are more generic. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, for example, augmented reality headset with optical see-through, so you can actually see the real world. And um, uh, if you want to do see-through on, on a device like that, uh, you usually have a camera where you do video see-through. Uh, in terms of tracking, so uh, tracking is the most interesting part, I guess, when, when it comes to XR. Uh, the rendering is more straightforward than that. Um, for tracking, uh, one, one prominent device that also is in your phones is an inertial measurement unit, uh, so-called IMU. It's, it's pretty cheap uh, and it's pretty small, so this is an example how this looks. Uh, it has multiple sensors, so... Um, it has, for example, a gyro and accelerometer. It also has a magnetoscope, or so a compass, but uh, usually that's not used in terms uh, because of error. Uh, and um, it's a very high frequency sensor, uh, so compared to the optical sensors I will show you uh, in, on the next slide, uh, you get a very high frequency signal. And um, yeah, this is uh, how VR uh, what, what the minimal requirement is for VR, but you, you only get three degrees of freedom out of that uh, by itself. So that means only your head's rotation uh, will be recognized um, by, by the tracking system. Or if it's a controller, it will be only the rotation of the controller and that, not the position in space. If you want the position in space, you need to have optical tracking. Um, for example... This is uh, the work of Philipp Zabel. Um, he's uh, implementing an open source driver for the Oculus CV1. And this is exactly this headset uh, seen in an uh, infrared view. So the camera is a USB camera and a regular USB camera with a either infrared filter or an infrared sensor, in the best case. Uh, and this is what the camera sees the regular person or the human eye wouldn't see this light because it's out of our visible spectrum. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there are like squares around these blobs, these so-called blobs. Uh, with uh, primitive computer vision algorithms, these blobs can be detected. And with these uh, blobs, the position can be calculated of the headset in space. In combination with the IMU you saw on, the others, uh, on this slide before, uh, there, there needs to be something done called sensor fusion. So we have the data from one sensor from the camera, which runs at uh, 60 hertz or something, uh, at regular camera frame rates uh, or frequencies, and the IMU runs at much faster frequencies, I guess about 10 kilohertz. And um, uh, this needs to be fused. So uh, this is one style of external optical tracking. The other style is the other way around, where the camera uh, emits the laser and uh, the, the sensor is on the headset. So in this case, um, the, for example, this is the lighthouse tracking system. It has two rotors uh, where two lasers rotate and uh, when, when they hit the sensor on the, on the headset, you get a timestamp and then you can calculate uh, something similar like here. And for, from these techniques, you get six degrees of freedom. That means you can also uh, recognize if the user moves up or down or in space. Um, another uh, way of tracking, which is easier in terms of hardware, uh, is uh, SLAM. That's from robotics. Uh, it's called simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, but basically, in uh, XR, we call that inside-out tracking. That means that you have a camera in the headset, um, and uh, we run some computer vision algorithms to get uh, the feature points, and then the feature points uh, are stored in a, in a database, and you can see uh, where you saw the, if you saw this feature in the last frame. And um, from this, you can also calculate the, the position and in robotics, it's also used for calculating a map of the uh, real environment. Um, so uh, the, the SLAM is a very popular method of tracking because it's easy to implement in hardware. But it's a bit tricky to do that in software, uh, especially if you want things like low latency. Uh, the next point 
uh, is input in VR because not uh, only uh, like the rendering is interesting and gives us immersion, like stereo rendering for each, uh, one image for each eye uh, is immersive definitely and if you move your head. But one thing that gives us even more immersion, so more connection to reality is the input in, in VR. Um, for example, when I first did a VR demo back in 2013 uh, without controllers because it wasn't a, a thing back then, people asked me, oh, where are my hands in VR? I would like to see a representation of my body. And with tracked controllers, uh, this is now more possible and uh, this, the experience can be more immersive. And I have like two different types of controllers here. The one of, on the left um, is a simple controller with just an IMU, so you just can get the rotation from it, and it has a touchpad and a button. It doesn't even have a trigger. Uh, but it's for, for, for simple things like pointing on something and clicking on it, uh, it's enough. But uh, on the right side, we have a more complex controller, um, which uh, also has things like finger tracking. So the, it has, here on the left side, it has a proximity sensor, and it detects how far uh, your fingers are away from the controller, uh, which gives you already the possibility to have a virtual representation of your hand. Um, it also has uh, six degrees of freedom tracking, so you can actually position your hands in space correctly, which gives us more immersion. Um, so uh, in terms of what devices these are, this is uh, the Daydream controller. Uh, we have a branch in Monado that, that uh, supports that uh, from Peak Black. Um, but I will come to details what Monado is uh, and where you can get that later. Uh, and this is the uh, Valve Index controller, a pretty nice controller. And the best thing uh, to use in, in VR for, for, for interaction is uh, something we have with us all day. It's our body and hands. Um, since uh, with our real hands, uh, we, we can experience the things even more realistic. Uh, it's like you, you, when you see your hands uh, in, in VR that actually look like your hands, um, you recognize this from the real world because um, you maybe notice that you look at your hands quite a lot. Like when I pick this bottle, I'm actually looking at my hands and I know how they look. Uh, so if you have like a weird virtual representation of different hands, it's not as immersive as if you have your real hands. And uh, hand tracking can be done by pure computer vision. Um, this is a stereo camera, which is also infrared. It emits an infrared light, uh, and it's a wide-angle stereo camera. Uh, and uh, with some computer vision and uh, uh, machine learning even, uh, there can be a virtual representation of the hands calculated from this image. Uh, on the right side, I have a more cl classical approach at, um, at hand tracking, uh, which is mechanical. Uh, it has the disadvantage of uh, not being very user-friendly, so you need some time to, to put this on. It's not like this, where you don't need to do anything. You just have your hands. Uh, but it has the advantage of haptic feedback which is something uh, not there with, with the other type of hand tracking. Uh, and in VR in general, haptic feedback is not something we have like in the real world, so I cannot really touch the table and, and lean on it uh, in VR. Something I can do is maybe vibrate, let the controller vibrate, or maybe do acoustic feedback that replaces the haptic feedback because the sensorics in the brain, uh, they they are very tolerant, so you can do acoustic feedback and the, the human mind will, will find it okay uh, in terms of immersion. Uh, so this was uh, the rough crash course about what we have uh, in, in XR, what, what the challenges are, what the types of devices are. And now I wanted to point out some, some projects that implemented that uh, in, in, in open source. Let me just, okay. So one important thing uh, that needed to be done in the Linux graphics stack is uh, something called direct mode. Um, it's uh, 
the, the possibility to, to lease the display of the headset so it's not um, used by the window manager as a desktop display and um, the, the application or the XR runtime can render to it directly. Um, it's based on a work by Keith Packard and he introduced the non-desktop uh, property on, uh, on displays. You can see it in XR and R maybe and you were wondering what this is. Um, and uh, it has the advantage of not only that windows don't show up, like desktop windows don't show up on your display uh, by, by mistake, uh, it also has the advantage that you can render with a native refresh rate on the HMD. For example, HMDs have usually a refresh rate of 90 or like the more modern one, uh, 144 and like all the desktop displays have just a refresh rate of 60 and uh, in the old days of open source uh, VR um, we were unlucky to run the, 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 the headset at the same refresh rate as the, as the desktop so this was quite bad and this was re uh, resolved uh, I guess early 2019 this landed in the stack uh, so it needed a couple of changes, so you need a, a fairly recent MESA for that and fairly recent uh, XR and R and stuff. And uh, Vulkan as well. So the Vulkan extension is called Acquired XLib Display. And as soon as this was like uh, available, I implemented it in XR Gears. This is a demo application I wrote um, that renders a stereo scene uh, in Vulkan and um, it is the gears, you know them, and um, uh, it uses the, this extension uh, as a reference implementation. I also had other backends like extended mode, so uh, if you don't render directly to the display, it's called extended mode. Um, and um, I had extended modes in uh, Wayland and XCB, and also a KMS backend, I guess, for Intel. Uh, what uh, I, the work I did here later became uh, the basis for the compositor in, in Monado. So Monado is our open source runtime we develop at Collabora, uh, our open source OpenXR runtime. And one aspect of the runtime is to provide all of the stuff so the application doesn't need to deal with it. So the runtime has this compositor that opens, uh, it leases the display, and uh, you only have the standard API. Uh, to, to submit frames to that. And later I made a second iteration of this application which is just an OpenXR client which makes the code like uh, 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 reduces it by, uh, one, uh, by one half at least. And on Wayland um, the situation was uh, 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 was different so there, this needed to be implemented on Wayland as well. Um, and uh, if you want to know details about direct mode on Wayland, it was mostly done by Drew DeVault, and a uh, protocol was specified by NXP. It's called DRM, DRM Lease Unstable V1, and the Vulkan extension is also called similarly as uh, for X. Um, this also supports X Wayland clients. That means you can ri uh, run an X application. Uh, with that as well, and it will utilize the direct mode. Uh, this is a screenshot from Drew. He did that through the lens, so uh, you can actually see that it runs on the display. Uh, and uh, it's not like all of this is not upstream yet. I guess uh, there is a merge request for the Vulkan spec specification. Uh, this, ex this protocol needs to be implemented in the Wayland compositor, uh, so you need to have a compositor that implements that. And there is a branch for Monado for the runtime, so it can actually utilize that. Um, so now we have the, the HMD working, uh, like the display working. And we need to get some tracking data. Um, I wanted to point out some, some notable uh, open source uh, tracking projects. Uh, most prominently, maybe OpenHMD. Funny thing is that OpenHMD has a buff going on right now. So they are not attending uh, at this talk. I can talk whatever I want about them. Uh, hopefully, they won't see the video. No, but uh, OpenHMD is a 
a community of enthusiasts and they uh, have their methods and tools to, to get support for hardware pretty quickly. So they analyze um, the HIT protocol the display is having, uh, the, the HMD is having uh, over USB with the PC and try to implement that. And uh, mostly what uh, is there in H OpenHMD is 3 dof tracking. So they have, it, it's, it's uh, rather quickly to get a new headset supported with 3 dof tracking. So just the IMU, but it's more complicated to get uh, positional tracking done. And OpenHMD is currently implementing positional tracking for the Oculus CV1. This is work done by Philipp Zabel and Jan Schmidt. Uh, they also did a couple of talks about this in the past. Uh, maybe other projects uh, I uh, should point out uh, are here. So there are many projects that, that actually provide low-level access to the device, but they don't provide a consistent API for applications and are rather like experiments. Um, also one slam I want to point out is MapLab. It's a pretty decent slam. Um, uh, SLAM is usually uh, used by uh, robotics and used in research a lot, so, uh, but there are several open source implementations. Um, what I was doing uh, back in the day, this is uh, from 2017, um, we worked on a project called Vive Libre, um, and here you can see uh, the lighthouse tracking we implemented. So we, uh, this code is based on OpenHMD and the Lighthouse Redux documentation. And this is just a MapLab uh, visualization of what we have here. So here are these points is the headset basically uh, seen from the base station, the one with the rotors you s uh, you've seen before. And this is the configuration file from the headset. You can read out as JSON. Um, these are the positions and uh, the normals of the sensors on the headset. And um, with the d data from the sensors, we could reconstruct um, this so-called station view. And with a, a simple algorithm from OpenCV, it's called a PNP, point and point algorithm. You can give this algorithm a bunch of 2D points and a bunch of 3D points, and then it calculates the position in 3D space according to the camera. Um, and uh, so this was uh, when we prototyped uh, the, the lighthouse tracking. And um, the project or the code was picked up by a project called LibSurvive. And um, it is a free and open source lighthouse driver. They added uh, many things to our work, like uh, proper filtering. So filtering is the, the complicated part of, of getting multiple sensor data. So sensor fusion and filtering are kind of synonymous. Um, and uh, they also added support for controllers um, and also support for newer headsets. And they have uh, multiple so-called poses that uh, just multiple backends that can that are competing at the same task to, to figure out which, which approach is the best. Um, uh, the project was done by a guy called uh, C.N. Lore. This is him uh, running the code on a Raspberry Pi. I, I guess he's also doing the rendering on a Raspberry Pi, which is pretty nice. And this is an old Raspberry I guess this is a version 2 or something. Um, and we have a branch. Uh, Christoph, my colleague Christoph, implemented uh, LibSurvive in Monado. So it's actually now usable uh, with the OpenXR API. And just uh, so you don't need to read this, um, just to show how many open source SLAM implementations there are, um, there are quite a lot. Uh, they uh, have different versions and different quality of projects. Um, most, uh, most of them are from, from academia. And there is a site, openslam.org, that catalogizes all of them. Um, but we, in, uh, for Monado, we will choose one for you. Uh, in, in the near future, so you don't need to choose that. Uh, but there's a lot of going on in open source SLAM. Uh, I, I mentioned this a couple of times now. Um, OpenXR is a standard API from Kronos, uh, like OpenGL and Vulkan. And uh, it, it tries to achieve a problem the industry had before OpenXR, 
Um, before OpenXR, we had only vendor-specific APIs. So most vendors that did a headset also did their API. That means that applications were not portable. Uh, it was mostly the abstraction was done by the engines uh, like Unity and Unreal. So most of the projects uh, used, for example, Unity, so they could run on multiple vendors. Um, but OpenXR tries to standardize, tries to standardize that, and uh, we hope that it will get rapid adoption. It was released last year, so early 2019 or something like that. Um, so it's still new. Uh, but most of the big vendors uh, are in, in the spe specification uh, or on, on the, on the, in the group that specifies that. And um, we at Collabora decided to, to implement this API as well. And we did that in Monado, um, our, our open source runtime. Uh, so Monado implements OpenXR and provides uh, the device drivers from, for example, OpenHMD or LibSurvive. Uh, but it also has its own device drivers that we just write for Monado in our internal um, driver library. For example, we have uh, device drivers for the... Uh, OSVR HDK2, or we have, uh, we are currently working on a PSVR driver, uh, which also will have positional tracking. Um, so my colleague Pete Black is working on that. Um, and I also recently wrote a native driver for, uh, for the Vive and Index family of headsets uh, that's currently quite simple, but it will evolve in the future. So we, as I mentioned already, we have a Vulkan compositor that, uh, that opens the display for the application and communicates with that. Uh, and we're currently working on 6 of tracking. And as I mentioned, we are also looking into providing SLAM for that. So uh, Monado manages uh, the devices, uh, the camera devices, for example, um, from, from not only the cameras that track the headset, but also cameras that are on the headset um, uh, that could be used for video see-through, for example. And uh, this is uh, a video from my colleague, Pete Black. He gave it to me today. Uh, I think he never released that. Um, it's an example of his PSVR tracking. Not sure if you know how the headset looks, but here you see the emitters on the headset and um, uh, the positions that are emitted uh, uh, calculated by his algorithm. Uh, so this is work in progress, and soon you will have that uh, exposed uh, through the OpenXR API. So uh, this was an uh, overview of, of what's going on in, in, in terms of drivers and tracking and runtimes. Uh, and now, since we have that now, kind of, we can build on top, and what do we want to do with that? What, now, now we have VR in Linux or in open source, uh, and one thing uh, that can be done with that uh, is a project I've been working on for the recent time, and it was uh, released, I guess, uh, mid-2019, so uh, it's XR Desktop. And um, in XR Desktop, we have... Uh, made a stack of libraries that interface with, with existing window managers or compositors uh, like this. Uh, this is, for example, GNOME Shell. Um, we get the window buffers from GNOME Shell and, and can display them in VR. And uh, what all we also do is to get the input from the controllers and synthesize this so uh, the, the 2D desktop receives mouse and uh, keyboard strokes. Um, like uh, 3D desktops were, uh, are not new. Like there were several open source 3D desktops or VR desktops. Um, but what uh, is new in our approach is that we try to interface with the existing window manager so that you don't run the 3D desktop separately, uh, separated from your regular desktop, but you can just mirror the existing desktop. And um, this is something that was sponsored by Valve. So th 
thank you for that. Without them, XR Desktop wouldn't be uh, what it is right now. And I have a demo, not a live demo, but I have a video. Uh, since doing live demos uh, when, with VR is kind of crazy, I guess. But I have colleagues that do that. Um, so um, this is me using Inkscape uh, in, in, in VR. So um, what you can see here is that I, I'm dragging the window around and I'm moving it close to me. So uh, if you move things closer, then you have more precision. Uh, you can, of course, uh, use it from far away, but uh, there will be an accumulation of, of error in the tracking of, of handshaking. This is also something uh, you have to um, think about because you are holding the controller in your free hand and it's not on the table like with the mouse, so you have handshaking. And I'm, I'm showing my, my insane drawing skills in Inkscape here. Um, and, um, yeah, as you can see, we have the cursor uh, that is uh, shown on the desktop as well in, uh, in VR, and it is shown at the position uh, of the end of your ray, so-called ray from the controller. And this is just one game from GNOME Games that I try to solve. Um, as you can see, we also, uh, when you click uh, on, on the end of the pointer, uh, there is an animation uh, emitted. And um, this was a model dialogue uh, right now. So if, if the model dialogue is opened, we overlay it uh, in 3D space over the, the window as well, uh, which, is, which has had to be implemented. Uh, it's not like appearing in, in the zero position of the world. And a solitaire is actually a nice thing to do in, in VR. Uh, every time I, I do a longer test, I, I play a, a round of solitaire, I guess. So uh, this is Krita, also has a model dialogue. So uh, the, the actual uh, widgets are rendered as they are do, done usually. Um, and uh, we get the buffer from, uh, from the window manager. And uh, this demo is showing GNOME, but we uh, have also integration for KDE. And um, I'm using Krita to draw in VR. Um, of course, um, there uh, could be many improvements. For example, one feature I heard many people want, would like to have, also my colleague Christoph, is that you put like other windows on the right hand and you could just use the color picker uh, on your hands and um, to, to interface uh, better with the 2D application. So uh, let's skip a bit forward. I'm browsing the web with cats. So um, we, uh, on the controller, you have a touchpad, and you can just scroll feeds as you are used to. Um, and this is also another example of a model dialog. So it's quite usable if you get used to it. Um, OK. Um, So another interesting concept uh, in, in XR is the concept of actions. Um, in traditional games or uh, input systems like SDL, uh, you were listening, for example, for the space bar uh, or uh, looking if you got an event from the space bar, press or release or mouse clicks. And with an action system, this is kind of decoupled. Uh, so uh, now we don't uh, check if the space bar is pressed, uh, but we check if the user wants to jump, for example. Um, this is necessary since uh, XR controllers are very heterogeneous, and the, the hack the PC gaming industry did and just uh, supposed everyone has an Xbox controller doesn't work anymore. So uh, there is something called... Um, uh, actions and bindings, and uh, the actions are defined by the application. I want to jump, and this is a Boolean operation, or I want to move forward, and this is an analog op operation, for example. And the bindings need to be created uh, by the runtime or by the user uh, that has the device. That means, oh, I have this controller here, this, uh, this uh, presentation controller, and if I press the right button, 
the, the thing should jump. And um, uh, this is available in, in the OpenVR API, which is the API Steam VR uses, and as well in the uh, OpenXR API. Uh, usually, like in OpenVR, this is specified by JSON. In OpenXR, it's specified in code. But uh, on our OpenXR branch for XR Desktop, we also have a JSON format that's quite similar to this one. So this is how the mappings look for XR Desktop in particular. Uh, this is the index controller. Um, we have two different sets of actions. Um, one set is for interacting in 3D with the windows, and the other set is for doing the 2D desktop uh, operations, like right-click, left-click, and scroll. And the 3D operations are uh, pushing and pulling the window in, in Z-space or on the Z-axis and opening menu and stuff like that. Um, so this is also translatable to the other controllers. Um, So let's, let's uh, look at some software in our stack. Uh, on the very bottom, we wrote, like, like our stack is written in glib, and uh, we introduced a couple of glib libraries. For example, Gulkan is our Vulkan abstraction library, where we do some things we require to, to display uh, windows in, uh, in 3D and render objects. Uh, we have GXR, which is the uh, library that abstracts both OpenXR and OpenVR uh, APIs. So you can uh, write an application in GXR that actually runs on both APIs. And in XR Desktop, uh, which is also a library, we pro provide two types of applications. Um, the one is an overlay application. This means that the scene is rendered by the VR runtime, and we just supply the windows. And we have also a scene application, which means where we render the full scene, where we render the stereo buffers and submit the final stereo buffer rendering to the runtime. Um, the overlay app has the advantage that you can use, uh, that you can see the windows uh, drawn over a VR application that you're running. It means you can play a game and uh, see desktop windows. And the other uh, the scene app has the advantage that we have full control of the renderer and can display as many windows as we want. This, uh, the other one has limitations. Um, libinputsynth is the library where we uh, do uh, button presses and mouse clicks and mouse position manipulation. We have several backends for that. Uh, for example, XDO on X11. And there's also stuff for Wayland in there. And this is how we interface basically with, with the window manager. Uh, on on KWIN uh, for KDE, there is a plugin uh, that can be loaded, which is quite convenient since uh, we don't need to fork KWIN. Uh, on, on GNOME Shell, the situation is different. We need to fork GNOME Shell uh, to, to interface with it. But this will hopefully change in the near future when I do my upstream work. And. Um, so again, uh, libinputsynth um, was required, so we can actually also do clicks on the desktop that runs uh, uh, in, uh, in the, at the same time as, as we do it in VR, um, which wouldn't be required if we had a standalone VR compositor. This is just required because we want to run on both. Um, yes and I talked about that already. Um, so how do we share the window buffers? Um, we do zero copy operation on the, so we don't download the windows from the GPU. The, all the window buffers stay on the GPU. Uh, we use a GL Vulkan interop because the, sadly the compositors are still using GL, uh, which is not a big problem since there are extensions available to, to share memory between them. So this is how the extensions are called uh, in Vulkan and GL accordingly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on Intel, this extension is not implemented as far as I know, so this is a limitation. Um, on Intel, uh, the, the extension is not implemented in GL. That means if we had a Vulkan uh, window manager, it would be fine. Um, and uh, yes. 
and the overlays are currently only implemented in uh, the open VR implementation of XR desktop since um, uh, the, the XR, the open XR alternative or, um, for that is called XR composition layer is currently not implemented in Monado. So we are working on that as well. So this is an example of the scene renderer uh, with my example image, the, the hawk from Wikipedia. We can render many hawks. Um, our upcoming release uh, of XR Desktop is coming soon. So shortly after FOSTEM, we will release 014. It's our biggest release yet with the most lines of code changed uh, and most commits, like we have about 364. We are two developers. Um, we changed a bunch of APIs so it can run uh, OpenXR and OpenVR backends with the same code. Um, so look out for that. It's already on Git Master. Uh, if you wonder where to get XR Desktop, if you're an Arch user, you're lucky. We have very good Arch user repository packages. We have uh, Ubuntu PPA, uh, which, is, which is maintained, but maybe not uh, updated currently, but we're working on that as well. And of course, you can build it from source. Uh, we have a wiki article on that. So let's take a quick look in our roadmap. What are we trying to do in the near future? We would like to have a virtual keyboard. Uh, currently on OpenVR, we are using the one from SteamVR. On OpenXR, we currently don't have one. So it would be nice to have the same one on both APIs. We want to implement GLTF loading. So we also have the controller models on the OpenXR implementation and can also maybe load other cool models like a scene where you, where you spend your time and when you're using your desktop. Um, scripting is also something we are looking out to. And uh, for the maybe not so near future, uh, we wanted to do a 3D widget toolkit. I would call that G G3K, um, because we have a lot of code that is related to that, but it's just not nicely in one library, and it doesn't have a nice API. And with that, we could do something that's called maybe XR Desktop Shell, where you have uh, not only Windows floating around, but maybe a full a uh, desktop experience with a clock and widgets and workspaces. So this is uh, the future. Uh, also, what's maybe interesting is how to interface with 2D uh, toolkits. So um, we can also render uh, from the 2D toolkit directly into VR without using the window manager, which is nicer since we can do stuff like high DPI and uh, maybe nicer fonts. Um, for that, we need uh, zero copy access to the toolkit. Uh, GTK3 had something called GTK off-screen window. And GSK, it's different. Uh, we need to access uh, GTK3. Uh, GTK4 is, uh, has now a scene graph. It's called GSK. So they change a lot. Um, and I have an example for GTK3 for that. Um, native 3D UI, so what do you need a 3D widget toolkit for? It's a nice thing. Um, since uh, you can have actual 3D widgets. Uh, this is maybe not 3D enough. Uh, this is like a combination between 2D and 3D, but you can also have like total 3D UI like you would work with uh, the reality. And this is, I guess, the way to move forward uh, to have native 3D applications. Also font rendering, I want to uh, point out Mozilla Pathfinder, which is um, uh, font rendering uh, for XR and it's Apache licensed. And uh, one more interesting thing is uh, what about 3D applications, native 3D applications? It would be nice to have a protocol for that. Uh, so the renderer uh, for the 3D application could render, for example, a stereo buffer and receive the position from the compositor. Uh, or we could also supply native geometry to the compositor, which renders uh, the 3D application. This would have the advantage that we could do transparencies, occlusions, and physics um, if we use a real model for that. Uh, Drew DeVault uh, worked on that. He uh, has in his uh, project called uh, WXRC. Uh, it's a 3D window manager, or VR 3D, uh, window manager. And uh, it can take, 
applications, 3D applications as clients. So he uh, designs a WAN protocol for that. Uh, it's pretty neat. Check it out. Um, this is a demo uh, where he opens uh, 2D surfaces first, but the most interesting part for me was when he opens a 3D application. And this is also something uh, I would like to see in XR Desktop. And since he specified a protocol, it's pretty neat to implement that. And this is the 3D cube. Okay. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes LibreOffice doesn't want to skip the slide if I have a video. <clears throat> now it did. Okay, if you want to get involved, uh, we are on free, uh, Freenode, or we have a Discord, and look at our wiki on our Twitter and GitLab. Um, w there's also a FOSXR conference. Uh, it will be held again in Amsterdam. That's the second iteration. So if you're interested, it's around Blender conference. So we are looking forward to see you there. And I guess now we can come to questions. So, any questions? Do you see a, a future for the desktop with VR, but with mouse and keyboard interaction, like we just saw here yeah. at the end? So the question was, if I see a future for mouse and keyboard interaction in VR. So, definitely, as a programmer, I enjoy to have a physical keyboard, and. Um, for this, um, we would require a virtual, either virtual representation of the keyboard in VR, or you just have augmented reality, where you just use your, virtual, uh, your real keyboard and can see that. Um, so definitely, um, there are also projects, uh, for example, uh, the window manager I showed in the end, I guess it has only keyboard and mouse support. In XR Desktop, it's kind of complicated, since we move the mouse pointer around, uh, this could get quite hacky to decouple that from the real mouse. So I wonder how to solve that, but with standalone uh, VR compositors, it's quite possible. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, is it compatible with other VR applications, like what if you want to start a VR game inside it? Uh, does that require any kind of special support for, uh, for it to work? Um, uh, do you mean XR Desktop or OpenXR? Uh, uh, like XR Desktop, yes. Mm -hmm, yeah. So XR Desktop can run on top of a VR application if you have it in overlay mode. That's possible. So this is also one uh, feature we intended the design uh, to be that we can run XR Desktop. You can show existing uh, desktop windows over VR applications. So this was one goal. Currently on OpenXR it's not supported because this would require some changes in Monado which are going to happen sometime. So, uh, who are you targeting with OpenXR and Monado? With OpenXR? Yes. Uh, yeah, I hope that OpenXR uh, is uh, we targeting OpenXR for all XR application developers. So they write applications for the same API, and not only application developers, but engines in particular. There are many engines already supporting OpenXR, like Unreal, Unity, Godot Engine, for example. There was a talk yesterday by my colleague Christoph. He implemented support in the open source Godot engine for OpenXR. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. <laughs>